Speaking of old and myself here, today is a very special day. 29 years ago today, Jeannie and I said I do for the first time. This is our 29th anniversary of our, of our wedding. So I know I look too old to be married to someone as young as she uh, is, but uh, truth is we're pretty close to the same age. She just went like this to me. See how good I do 29 years later that I, you know, I know where to stop. <laughs> but I am very, very thankful that God has brought uh, Jeannie into my life. And hard to imagine when you get married what 29 years later is going to look like. And uh, I'm excited that I've had the opportunity to do life with her and continue hopefully 29 more years. Um, trying to do math and see how old I'll be then, but... Uh, <laughs> We'll leave that as a guess for all the rest of you. Also, on this day, 28 years ago, was our very first Sunday in full-time ministry. So our one-year anniversary was our first day at the church that we went to right out of college. So it was June 3rd. It was a Sunday. Our first anniversary was our first Sunday at our new church, a little church in Montana, Livingston, Montana, where we pastored for seven and a half years before we came here nearly uh, 21 years ago. So... So thankful for that to look back and see how God is, has blessed us and helped us. Also, while I'm talking about important dates, one of my very good friends had a birth birthday yesterday, and he turned uh, an age that ends with a zero. Where's Pastor Brian? Is he here? He ducked out in the early service, too. So that dirty dog, uh, when you see him, you can figure out what birthday it is, right? It ends in a zero. He's no longer in his 30s. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. This morning we begin a new series, and we uh, had this song uh, presented. I don't know if you heard that for the first time, if you've heard the song, Who You Say I Am, but that song is loaded with truth. It's loaded with, with a message that we, as God's children, need to hear. We need to hear the truth about who we are in Christ who does God say we are? You see, our, our culture thrives and actually depends on our feeling less than enough. Pastor Brian. He's saying, uh, what? <laughs> I just might have mentioned that you had a birthday yesterday. And you duck. <laughs> so our, our, our culture depends on us and thrives on us uh, feeling less than enough. The success of marketing and advertising industry is contingent on us being dissatisfied with ourselves. Whether it's our body shape, our hair type, our hair color, uh, the success in our careers. Society tells us that we need to, we need to um, be more, we need to buy more. We need to have more, we need to do more, because what they say is that what we are and what we have is never enough. We live with this constant striving for more. And I wanna tell you today, if you haven't already figured out, it's a trap. It's a lie. You don't need more. Who you are, who God made you to be, is enough. But it's lies, lies upon lies that come at us that are telling us these things. Where do, where do those lies come from? If you were here last Sunday, Pastor Weaver preached a message titled it Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire, talking about the devil, the s Satan, the deceiver, the, the thief, the enemy of our soul. And if you weren't here last Sunday, I, I encourage you, go back, watch that message. That message kind of set the stage for where we're going with this series over the next few weeks um, about who God says that we are. We're going to be looking at uh, who he says we are, what our identity in Christ is, and also understanding that Satan has a lie for every truth that God says about who we are. He is a liar. He's the father of lies. John 8, tells us that Satan is a liar. He's the father of lies. And it says that there is no truth in him. Not one shred of truth. The Bible repeatedly tells us that he's a liar, that he's a deceiver, that his MO is to steal, kill, and 
destroy. Who is he out to destroy? Us, okay? Satan comes and he, he, he talks to you, but he will never, ever tell you the truth. He can't tell you the truth because there's no truth in him, okay? So he'll come and, and everything he says to you is meant to, to ruin you. And so I want to ask you this question. Why do we ever listen to him? Why do you ever entertain those lies that Satan brings to you as if you should listen to them? And not only why do we listen to them, we believe them. Why are we believing what the enemy tells us about who we are? I want to tell you how a lie works. So um, something doesn't need to be all true to destroy you. For instance, if I were to tell you right now that you have a terminal disease, and I know for a fact that you're going to die at 3 o'clock on July 1st, there's absolutely no truth to that at all. But if you want to believe that, it will change your life. You see, ultimately it comes down to this. Satan is a liar, and he's responsible for the lies that he tells. But we are responsible for the lies that we believe. We're responsible for believing, whether or not we're going to believe his lies. The Bible tells us that Satan is a schemer. He's the king of conflict. He's the master of deceit. And we found out that he's a very proficient liar. And so what we know is that we're in a battle. And the battle is God's truth versus Satan's lies. And the question is, whom are you going to believe? God's truth versus Satan's lies. Who are you going to believe? You see, the psalmist tells us this in Psalm 139 about God. He says this, verse 13, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had even passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Think about that for just a moment. The thoughts that God has for us are so numerous that they're, they're, they're beyond counting. Beyond the number of grains of sand on the shore. That's what God thinks of us. God told Jeremiah, and this is a promise to us, he said, I know the plans I have for you. It's plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. You realize that as you think about that, as you think about what God has done for us, we're created in the image of a perfect God. Each one of us is a masterpiece. His workmanship, created by God. He loves us. He cares about us. And his thoughts about you and his thoughts about me are so many that we can't even count it. Would you think about that? Do you think God is for you? Do you think God is doing things in your life? And yet we struggle to believe what he says is truth. For some reason we tend to listen to the one who lies and who can only tell lies rather than listen to God who is truth. Listen to some of these lies that Satan tells us. You may have heard one of these or two. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not talented enough. You're fat. You're ugly. You're dumb. You're stupid. You're a failure. You're incapable. You're inadequate. You're hopeless. You're useless. You're worthless. And that's just scratching the surface. How many may have heard one of those or two before? And truth, be, be honest, how many of you believe those lies? Why do we believe what he tells us about ourselves? Why is it so easy for us to latch on to and, and accept a negative remark like this 
and then push down a compliment when somebody gives us one? Why do we give in to fear? Why do we give in to anxiety rather than confidently be who God designed us, made us, purposed us, and says that we are? Because we believe lies, that's why. We believe a liar rather than God who is only truth. You see, Satan will tell you things like, how can you ever expect to be forgiven? Your sin is too great. You're a lost cause. God doesn't care about you. Those are lies. Don't believe the lies. God is perfect both in his loving us and his forgiving us. Satan, however, wants us to think that because we've fallen, we can't get back up and start over. When we do make mistakes, he wants, he wants us to feel like we're a hypocrite if we try again. How can you think of praying after what you did, is what he'll say. How can you think of going to church? You're such a hypocrite. And what he has is his thumb right on top of you. But if we're ever going to go stronger and become who God intends for us to be, it's not that we just don't listen to the lies of Satan. We need to listen to the truth. We have to be committed to listen to God's voice, to know his voice, and to believe what he's telling us through his word. And all of the other voices that are speaking into our lives begin to drown out. What we need to do is we need to fill our hearts, our spirits, our minds with the truth, with God's word. This is what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4. He said this, fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, and right. What happens if you fix your thoughts on something that's true? It's going to be really hard if you're fixed on the truth to ever entertain a lie. Fix your, fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, and right. Think about things that are pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. We need to remind ourselves about what God says about us and who we are in Christ. Listen to just a few of the scriptures, and there's a whole lot more, but for the sake of time, let me just hit a few highlights. The Bible says that we are alive with Christ, Ephesians 2, 5. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Greater is he who is in me. That's God. That's Jesus, the Holy Spirit, than the one who is in the world, Satan. It is not I who live, but Christ lives in me. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me the strength. I am God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me, who loves me. And multiple times through scripture, it says that we are greatly loved by God. Today, you need to know that you're loved by God and that he is crazy in love with you. And you all are sitting there looking at me like, huh? <laughs> Do you believe that's true? That you are loved by God and that he is crazy in love with you? See, the lie that Satan gives us is that you're not good enough. You don't measure up. God tells us, you're loved. You are loved by me. There's a lot of scriptures that talk about God's love, and again, just for the sake of time, I want to hit a, a, a couple of those highlights. 1 John 4, 10 says, this is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. That's love. God's love. John three sixteen. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 Paul says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. 
Nothing. He goes on to talk about death or life, angels or demons, our fears about today, our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. And that's what we're talking about, right? Nothing can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Psalm 36, verse 5 to 7. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. I don't know if you've ever saw anything that talked about how big space is. But just our Milky Way galaxy, it's, it's I, I, I can't remember how, how far it is, but it's like, uh, anybody know? Here's what I do. I start talking, I'm going, I don't know the answer to this. It's a long, long ways. I think it's something like if you're traveling at the speed of light, it's like 10,000 light years across. So if you're traveling 5.88 trillion miles per second, which is the speed of light, you start at one end of the Milky Way galaxy to take you 10,000 light years to get across. That's just the Milky Way galaxy. We're not talking about the universe. As far as the heavens, this is what the psalmist says, your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the ocean depths. Your care for people and animals. You care for people and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. God is, his love for you is amazing. His love for you is huge. He is passionately in love with you. God loves you. And he wants you to experience his love. Listen to Paul's prayer. And this is the foundation for where I'm going to go from here. All this is kind of groundwork coming up to this point. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. Paul prays a prayer uh, for the Ephesians. And it's a prayer for us too. We can, we can tag on to this. Uh, a prayer to understand and know God's love. Verse 14. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. Everything. He's the creator of everything in heaven on earth. Are you included in that? Yes. You're his creation. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources. Kids, how many of you wish your parents had unlimited resources? Okay. Here, all of us, God's children, guess what? Our Father God has unlimited resources. I'm not just talking about money, but that, that too. He has enough more than enough, and for all of us. And Paul says, I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts. He will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should. He's saying, I want you to have the power to understand how wide how long, how high, and how deep God's love is. May you experience the love of God. He says, I pray that you would know the depth and the dimension of his love. And, and, and he tags onto that, may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. So Paul prays that these Ephesians would grasp hold of something, that, they would, that, that, that would pave the way for the, uh, God's amazing work in their lives. And this amazing thing that Paul prays that they would take hold of is what? His love. God's love. I want to ask you this question. How many times have you heard the statement, God loves you? Just take a guess. More than five? Jesus loves you. And I hope what, what, what comes to your mind is not this little yellow smiley face that has a little caption that says, Jesus loves you. Smile, Jesus loves you. Uh, is there anything wrong with that? I don't know. But it's like we cheapen what we're talking about here. To know God's love. Why is it that when Paul talks about knowing God's love, it seems like he gets so excited that he can hardly contain himself? But yet when we hear about God's love, it's like rather than, rather than getting up and dancing about it, it's more like, ah. I've heard that one before. Seriously, that's the message today? God loves you? 
How many of us, we don't get excited when we hear about God's love? It's just become something routine. It's kind of on the level of hearing someone say, God bless you when you sneeze. We don't even think about it, right? I think the reason that we don't get excited is because we don't get it. We don't know it. We don't get it. You see, Paul, Paul's not praying here that God's people would, would know that God loves them. What he's praying is that they would know God's love. Do you get the difference? It's not just knowing that God loves us. It's knowing God's love. And so let me ask you this question. Do you know God's love? Or is it just simply you know that God loves you? There's a huge, huge difference. Let me illustrate it uh, like this. I can know the molecular structure of water is a combination of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. And with that, I'm going to take a drink. About a month ago, I started with Invisalign. You know, those plastic braces that pop in and out of your mouth, and my mouth just gets as dry as can be. My lips are starting to get chapped. This is the first time that I've preached with them in. I teach with them on Wednesday night, and my class puts up with me, but I think I'm getting better at talking. You probably wouldn't even have known that they're there, but my mouth is about as dry as can be. So, so thinking about this molecular structure of water being two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, how many knew that? You learned that, you learned that somewhere in science, right? Okay. That does nothing for me on a blazing hot day when I'm working outside and I've been sweating like crazy and I'm hot and my mouth feels like I've been sucking on cotton. You know, it's not at that point when I'm thinking, hmm, let's see, water is two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. Here's the deal. I could care less about H2O at that point. I'm not thinking about water and the properties of water. Here's what I want. Water! I want water, and I'm going to look for water until I satiate my appetite to get my mouth feeling like something other than a big ball of cotton. I need ice cold water. And I'm not going to be satisfied with just understanding the properties of it. My need's not for, for deeper insights into water, I need water. Knowing that God loves you, but not knowing his love, okay? Knowing that God loves you, but not knowing his love is like someone who studies water, but never, ever drinks it. Thank you, Pastor Weaver. You see, Paul's prayer is that we would know this love. That we would understand somehow, somehow to grasp hold of how wide, how long, how high, and how deep Christ's love is. But the word understand doesn't mean gain a mental grasp on it. Get a mental concept. It means take hold of it. It means get it. It means it means, it means you experience this, this love. Paul wants you and me to know love, true love, to know God's love, even if there's no way that we can fully comprehend it. You see, here's what I want you to know today. God is in love with you. God is crazy about you. And his love for you is so amazing. It's so incredible. Intellectual understanding of God's love isn't the same as experiencing it, but it's a good place to start. So basically, my message this morning, I want to take time to just think about and, and talk about God's love in these four dimensions that Paul mentions here as a way to maybe kind of prime the pump a little bit and start getting it into us. So he mentions these, th these four dimensions of God's love. First, he talks about the width of God's love. You see, the width of God's love might be the most obvious thing that distinguishes his love 
versus human love. You see, we love, we love certain people. Or we love certain types of people. But God loves everyone. God so loved the... Who does that include? Everyone. I want you to think about the person that you most dislike in the world. And after the first service, don't include Satan in this. Okay, we already established. Yeah, don't listen to him. But I want you to think about the person in this world that you most dislike. And I don't want you to put on your pious Sunday face, oh, Pastor Jeff, I love everyone. I, I love everyone. Here's what I say, not true. Get honest. Get honest. I'm not saying you hate people. I'm just saying, if you're honest, there's people that you, that you don't love. So think about that person for just a minute. And this is what I, I want you to think about. God is crazy about that person. God's crazy in love with that person. And he loves them so much that he died for them. God's love is wide. And then he mentions the length of God's love, most likely a reference to time, which says that God's love is forever and always. It's not just something that's available on Sundays. It's not that God's love doesn't take holidays. It doesn't have regular business hours. God's love is everlasting. It's eternal, meaning that God's love never gives up. Your love and mine, it, it, it quits at some point. You see, here's, here's what happens. We, we try to love somebody, but if they don't take hold of that, if they don't respond, then, you know, forget it. I tried, pff, you're on your own. We may not say it that way, but that's how we, that's how we act. There's only a limit to what we're going to do for someone. There's a certain amount of time and a certain amount of chances, and after that, they're on their own. But God isn't like that. God's love is more like the Energizer Bunny that just keeps going and going and going and going and going and going. Never gonna stop singing. We always stop singing that song. I never did figure that one out. <laughs> Keep singing. But God's love just keeps going on and God's love doesn't give up on us. God tells us in his word as he told Moses in Deuteronomy 31, he told Joshua in chap Joshua chapter one, and he tells us too in the New Testament these words, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. I will never fail you, I'll never abandon you. Never will I ever, he says. He hasn't failed us in the past and he won't fail us in the future. We've been singing a song the last few months that says, God, you've never failed me yet. And that, those, those lyrics kind of set me a little bit at odd at first, but I'm thinking, in the reality of things, what we're doing is we're looking back over our life and seeing how faithful God is. And God, to this point, hasn't failed us. And if God hasn't failed us to this point, I can look forward to my future and be confident that God will not fail me from this point on. God's love is long and it doesn't give up. It's long lasting. His love is wide. His love is, is high. We talk about the height of God's love. You see, the Bible uses the word height in a lot of different ways. It could be simple, a simple uh, unit of measurement like we measure the height of this pulpit, it's so many inches tall. But it's also re uh, used to refer to uh, the extreme of something. Like a, a very loud noise. The, the highest possible noise level. Paul uses height to describe God's love. And, and I think what he's meaning is the quality. The quality of God's love surpasses anything that we've ever known. There is no love like God's. The height of his love is beyond anything that we have experienced and could ever experience. You see, there's, there's some people who, who look for the best in everything, look for the best of everything. They're not going to get something unless it's the best. I'm not going to buy that, just that every, everyday average kind of thing. I'm going to buy, if whatever's the best in that, I'm going to buy it. Some of you in the room are kind of like that. You'll save up your money. You're not going to just buy any old thing. You're going to buy the best of whatever it is. 
You want something quality that's going to last. Some of you are going, you know what? I can spend my money on other things. All I need is something to get me through. But when you think about this whole idea of God's love being the best thing that we experience, I, I just use coffee to illustrate that. Um, for, for instance, it, it used to be that if you wanted coffee, you'd just go to the grocery store and buy a can of coffee. How many of you know us? It ain't like that anymore. Okay? You used to just go to the store and it was like Folgers. That was, that was, that was life. Um, but now, you know, they, somewhere along the line, they came up with decaffeinated coffee. Now you got a choice. You can get coffee without caffeine. And then along comes flavored coffee. And so, you know, we're not just buying coffee. We're, we're, we're getting flavors of coffee. And then come along gourmet-type coffee from all these exotic places and gourmet flavors. And we'll actually pay five or six times uh, the price for a pound of coffee than just buying an ordinary coffee because, because we, want, we want something that's great, that tastes great. I mean, now you can go to one of these stores in the area, you know, they, they, I'm not going to use their names, um, but I mentioned the early service, we brew Friedrich's Coffee, that's a, a good company in town, but you can go to these places and you can buy a coffee in a cup and it's about as much as what you could go buy a can of coffee that you could have for months at home. So don't tell me you're not, you're not spending money to try to get the best that you, can, that you can do. But you get the idea. We want the best that there is no matter what the cost. Here's the deal. We as humans, we crave love. We crave love. People go to great lengths to get people to notice them. The kind of things that they do, the words that they use, the clothes that they wear, the way they style it, just to get someone to notice them. Because there's something in us that just wants and craves love and attention. Even more than, even, we we crave love more than coffee. More than the first cup of coffee on Monday morning. You see, in God we can experience the richest, the highest, the purest, the finest love imaginable. And not only that, it's free. There's a never-ending supply of God's love, and anybody who wants it can have all that they want. So God's love is so wide that it embraces everyone. It's so long-lasting that it won't let us go. It's of such high quality that it'll never let us down. And the last thing that we see is the depth of God's love. The word here used is a word used to describe the ocean. And I don't know if you know many facts about the ocean, but here's a few things that I learned. Three quarters of the surface of this planet Earth that we live on is covered with water. Do you know what the average depth of water is in the ocean? So you add up all the ocean together. See, the deepest part of the ocean is over seven miles deep. I don't know if you know how many miles that is. It's over 36,000 feet Light doesn't penetrate through water more than 300 feet. So everything beyond that is deep sea, and it's dark. You get 300 feet, there's still 36,000 plus feet to get to the bottom of the ocean at the deepest part. How deep that is, it's if you took the Empire State Building, the building with the spire on top, and you stack 30 of them on top of each other, you're still not peeking out of the, out of the water. That's deep. And you think about how much there is covering three-fourths of the surface of the water. Do you know that 94% of all life forms on earth are found in the ocean? 94%. The ocean is huge. The average depth of the ocean, you add it all up together, is over two and a half miles deep. There's a lot of water there. A human could go down safely with some apparatus to about 2,000 feet. That's, a, that's about it. The ocean is huge. And so as we think about the depth of God's love, God's love being deep, it speaks to us that it reaches into the deepest parts of our life. There's a deep longing in all of us to be loved. There are things in the deepest parts of our life that um, you'd never let anybody know. There's things that you've got deep in your life, and some of you might be more freely to share than others, but it doesn't matter who 
who of us we're talking about. There's probably something in everybody's life that's been pushed down. It's in that deep, dark corner behind a door that you don't even peek at and you don't want anybody else to see because you're afraid if they knew that about you, they wouldn't love you. But here's what we can say about God's love. It penetrates even to those places and you are not going to disappoint God or, or, or cause him to not love you at all. God's love is deeper than the deepest secrets that you have. And it can penetrate the darkness of our worst fears. And it can clean out the closets in our, in our heart that's full of sin, that's full of despair and self-hatred. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. God's love is so wide that it embraces everyone. It's so long-lasting that it won't ever let us go. It's of such high quality that, that uh, it'll never let us down. And it's deep enough to meet you at the deepest needs in your life. Did I mention earlier that God is crazy in love with you? You hear that. But here's the thing. We can talk about God's love, and that doesn't do it. It's not enough to know that God loves you. What Paul's praying here, and that I can't accomplish with my words in a message this morning, is for you to know God's love. Some of you have experienced God's love, and it's radically changed your life. Many of you in the room are sitting here feeling empty and just longing to experience something different. I want to invite you to stand this morning, and if you would, just quietly and close your eyes. What I want and my hope and what I believe God wants for us and from us this morning is to experience his love like we've never experienced it before. I mentioned that God's love can reach to the deepest parts. And he promises that it'll never, ever give up on us, never, ever let us go. When people will give up on us, when people will stop loving us, God's love is always there. With every head bowed and your eyes closed this morning, you're just saying, I've never experienced God's love. Or maybe I did at one point in my life, but I realize today I'm so far from him that I'm not experiencing what he wants for me in my life. And this morning with every head bowed, every eye closed, and you're just responding saying I want Jesus in my life and I want to experience God's love I want to experience freedom I want to experience salvation and healing it comes in Jesus if you'll just open your heart today and respond to him and I just want to ask if you would raise your hand to say Pastor Jeff that's me I'm reaching out today to God's love I need his love in my life. I need him to change me, to save me, to set me free, to forgive me. God, I pray for every hand raised in this room that your presence and that your love, a love as great and greater than the ocean would flood over every heart and life in this room. And those that are reaching out saying, that's me. God, would you just meet them and would they go beyond just a head knowledge, a, a, a conceptual understanding of the fact that you love them, to really know your love and experience you in a personal, real, dynamic, impactful way to change them, God, from the inside out. Thank you, Jesus. This morning, if, if you're here and you know you're, you're listening to the message and you know you've been listening way to way too many lies. You've been responding to the enemy of your soul who is nothing but a liar, full of lies, and he can't even tell the truth. And he's been speaking things and you've been listening to him and you've been believing the lies. You're believing that you're not good enough. You're believing that God couldn't do this for you. You're believing that you've gone too far. You're believing that, you know, you're a hopeless helpless, useless cause. 
The truth is those are all lies. We need to listen to what God is telling us about who we are and what he's done for us. And this morning, if you respond by saying, you know what, I've been listening way too long to the lies. I I mean, the fact that I was listening to them. And you'd say this morning with a raised hand, I'm committing myself to listen to what God says I am and who God says I am and not what the enemy, the destroyer, the, the deceiver is saying about me. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? And this is, this is just honest. I mean, this, this, you're not saying I'm a bad person. What you're saying is, I know that there's an enemy in my soul and he wants to destroy me and I'm no longer going to listen to that. It's a bucket of lies and I'm not going to listen to it anymore. I'm going to listen to the truth. The one who has the truth, who is the truth, and only tells the truth. The one who loves you, who is passionate about you, who is crazy in love with you, who gave his life for you, and he's saying, look, would you just respond to me? Listen to me. Hey, listen to me. So many voices. And we're so quick to latch on to those lies and say, you know what, that's true. And we just get beat down and whipped up. Now I want to say, how many of you say, I've been listening to too many lies, and I need to listen to the truth. And you commit today saying, I will listen to the truth. I will listen to the one who has the truth and who is the truth. If that's you this morning, just raise your hand. Here's the deal. Every one of us should be raising our hand today. I can't go raise your hand for you, but will you respond in your heart with a hand raised, with your heart reach out to God? And you'd say, God, I'm going to believe who you say I am. And you alone, the lover of my soul, the creator of my life, the one who knew me before I, I even lived a day or drew a breath, and you had everything planned out for me. And your plans are only good for me, not for harm or for evil, but, but with hope and a future. Who should we be listening to? As we sing this song this morning, I want to invite you just to come and stand and make that commitment to say, God, I'm going to listen to you from now on. I'm no longer going to listen to the lie. When I hear one of those lies, I'm going to step on it. I'm going to squash it. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to listen to what God says I am. Everything that God says you are, Satan has a lie. Don't listen to him anymore. So we sing this song and we declare who God says that we are. Would you come and just make a stand today saying, I'm choosing to listen to God.